Hello, uh, my name is Roman Drake, and today I want to talk about the roots of violence in the Yugoslav Wars of Partition. And I'm going to start off with a brief synopsis of the events that took place, and then I'm going to explain sort of the underlying causes. And I'm using two sources or references um, for these notes slash presentation. And one of them is a chapter or a piece within Politics of East Central Europe, which is right here, um, by Dr. Paula Pickering and Dr. Mark Baskin. Um, Dr. Pickering is my professor, and a supplemental piece by Dr. Anthony Obershaw. Um, so let's just get into it, talk about the background of, of what's going on in Yugoslavia at the time. So 1989, as we know, is the fall of nations. And the effects of this were particularly profound in Yugoslavia, because unlike a nation like Poland, which has a homogeneous population, as you can see from this map, Yugoslavia is very ethnically diverse. And it's not even ethnically diverse in the sense that there are concentrated um, groups of one minority in one aspect, and they're just separated, like broccoli and pasta on a plate. It's not the case. There's a lot of intermingling, especially among the Serbians, you can tell, or in Croatia and northern Bosnia. And we'll talk about why this is. But first, to understand Yugoslavia, you have to understand that it's a, a bunch of different ethnic groups, even though they're similar and mutually understandable in most cases, that were grouped together at the end of World War One so that they could stand up to large powers, because together they were, you know, but besides well, individually, they were too small to have any real large effect on world politics. Together, they could definitely stand up to most people, and, and they did affect the politics of the Balkans during the interwar period. But before that, even, and this is a good way to explain some of the ethnic movements within the country, is the Ottoman invasions. And the Ottoman invasions are, are profound in the effect of movement of peoples in Yugoslavia for two reasons. The first being Serbs are moved around quite a lot by the empire. They're given incentives by the Austrians, for example, to move north. So what the Austrians want to do is create a buffer in between them and the Ottomans. So they place the Serbs there. And that's why you see them in the northern parts like Croatia, outside of Maine, Serbia, Serbia proper, basically. And the second effect is the Bosnians. So the Bosnians the Bosniaks, rather, both culturally and ethnically, are a byproduct of Ottoman settlement. So religiously, obviously, their their belief is in Islam, and ethnically, they do their sharing with um, with the Ottoman, the Turkic people, and the same is true with Albanians. And so, what causes these these different groups? especially to develop an ethnic identity, is the federalization under Tito. So what Tito says is um, he's realized that he won't rule forever, and he's a unified country. He's the only one keeping it together. So he creates these federal republics, and they overlook um, ethnicity, basically. They, they're they just trying to create... They don't overlook it in the sense that they, well, they are deciding the regions based on ethnicity, but they, they underestimate the effect of the ethnic nationalism that will come after communism, that will actually serve to divide Yugoslavia and not to keep it together. So they create these divisions based on ethnicity so that each can send representatives to the, the Grand Yugoslav Assembly. But what they end up doing inadvertently is causing these people to develop not only ethnic identities, which they had before, but now they have national identities with defined and sometimes contentious borders. So that's a bit of a problem, and we'll get into that later. But, but that that's the centers basically for everyone saying, well, this this is my ethnic autonomous region, so I have a natural right to rule it. Uh, we have a natural right to extend our own people. You know, this is this can be a problem, and certainly, and certainly part of it if that desire is justified because it's not like based on arbitrary whims of the upper communist party. You know. They are deciding based on ethnic composition, but once again, extremely contentious. So we can talk about now the main players 
in this conflict, and the first uh, is, is obviously Serbia. And Serbia is always called the main aggressor. They're the main aggressor, they're the catalyst, they're the bad guys, they're the guys who NATO, NATO is not conducting a bombing campaign against Bosnia, or Croatia, or Slovenia, it's Serbia. And Serbia's been held back by this, but this is not an entirely fair evaluation um, of Serbia's participants. The reason they're most active in the war is because, one, they have the most people. They at least constitute a plurality of the Yugoslav population. But also, as you saw in the previous map, they're the most spread out. So, of course, they're going to be fighting in the most different places because they have their Serbs in Kosovo. There's Serbs in Bosnia, there's Serbs in Croatia, there's some Serbs in Slovenia, whereas the Croats are basically just Croatia and Bosnia. That's it. So they, they are fighting more, but there's a reason they're fighting more. Also, they had the most to lose, because under the Yugoslav government, even though Tito himself was not a Serb, his government was basically staffed by old Serbian elites. The same was true in the interwar period. Um, with the authoritarian regimes, it's Serbian conservative elites that are governing. And so they have political opposition from, from Croatians as well as liberal Serbs. There's some infighting. But basically, the status quo favored the Serbs at the time of the Tito's government. The next is Croatia. So Croatia is pretty important. Um, traditionally, they're not, not seen too much as an aggressor, but the truth is, they were. So originally, they are, quote, the victim of Serbian aggression. And the reason I say that is because Serbians began fighting along the uh, technical established borders of the Republic. But this is subject to question because you could say, well, well, the original establishment of the borders of the republics is totally arbitrary and unfair. So if you dispute the original arbitration of territory, you say, well, it's, it actually could be their place for them to fight for it. In any event, from a technical standpoint, it would seem as if Croatia was being invaded by Serbian fighters and militias. However, this idea or vision of them being the victim is inconsistent with their actual behavior because, as we'll note, Croatia, um, Franjo Tudman, um, I hope I didn't mess that up too bad, uh, and Slobodan Milosevic are basically agreeing to split Bosnia between Croatia and Serbia. So it's clear from this that the Croat extremists do want, it's, it's more than just defense, they have aggressive and um, territorial ambitions on Bosnia. So they're, they're not innocent at all on this issue. Um, something to talk about in Croatia is, is the Vance Plan, where 13 and a half uh, thousand troops would be stationed in Croatia so they could reintegrate um, the Serbian part of Croatia. So that's contentious and also, uh, I face a bit of a legitimacy problem, but we'll talk about that when we talk about Bosnia. This plan was never fully implemented because Croatian leaders could not agree to it. We have Bosnia. Bosnia is traditionally seen as the victim uh, of this conflict. And, and it's partially true because, because there's a sandwich between Croatia and Serbia who both are going after them. But they're not entirely innocent either. No party is basically entirely innocent in this affair. And you have Bosnians who are, one, recruiting jihadists worldwide, which is obviously not good for optics. And also, they too are massacring Serbs within Bosnia. So it's not they're not entirely innocent. But they are, however, the worst off in the sense that at the end of the war, about half their population has been displaced. Bosnia, not, not specifically Bosniaks, the ethnic group, Bosnians, Asinda, the citizens of the Bosnian autonomous region. And also they're the poorest. And this is not just industrial, it comes in armament too. So when the UN does an arms embargo against all of Yugoslavia, it actually benefits the enemies of the Bosnians because they're better off. The status quo favors the wealthier, the better armed people, which is the Serbs. And so they get 26,000 troops as opposed to 13 and a half. And a reason I think this is a problem is because something we talked about earlier in the course is the problem of legitimacy. When communist countries or ex-communist countries 
are, are forming democracies, a central issue that they need to establish is legitimacy. The government doesn't have legitimacy. The institution doesn't have legitimacy. No one will place any faith in the system. Then you're not going to be able to make real progress. So on that, you have a question in your mind. You're saying, well, if the Bosnians are requiring so much outside help from the UN or from NATO, you know, how legitimate is their government? If they have to stand on 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 greater powers, are they really are they really their own country? This is something to consider. The next country kind of I don't want to say country because that's another very uh, controversial issue is Kosovo. And something that's not really mentioned much, um, at least in the academic setting so far as I've observed, is that before World War One, Kosovo is actually majority Serb on an ethnic standpoint. It becomes more and more Albanian over time. And Serbian nationalists argue that, um, well, uh, that the Albanians who are living in Kosovo are pressuring, harassing, and basically forcing the Serbs out. And that's why. And that's why this this is partially true in tandem with the fact that that the Albanians just have a higher birth rate. But this is something to note is you say, is this a legitimate way of, of establishing a country? Just overgrowing the amount of all well, the number of, of people within your own ethnic group? No, I'm not saying one way or the other, but it's definitely something to consider. Anyway, so Kosovo wants to be independent. Um, from Serbia, definitely because they're majority Albanian at the time. At the time, I think it was like at least 80% at 99. And now it's maybe less than 10. Um, anyways, Kosovo begins with a democratic league. And they're trying to negotiate their way. And this doesn't work. This does not work. So what ends up happening is extremists take over. They say, we're going to we're now the Kosovo Liberation Army, which is definitely an extremist group. And they too, just like Bosnia, are bringing in extremists to fight against the Orthodox Serbs. So this is a problem. Um, and then they begin violent attacks against Serbian police. And so you could say, well, they're not really Serbian police. They're basically housing paramilitary groups. This is, this is a hard claim to make, but we know for a fact that within Kosovo, the violence can be largely, at least the inception of violence in Kosovo can be attributed to um, KLA, whether it's reactionary or not. Then you have uh, a footnote, kind of. I don't mean that in a pejorative way at all. Um, but the truth is Macedonia and Montenegro are not major contributors. Um, Montenegrins did participate in the siege of Dubrovnik with the Serbs against the Croats, but this is the extension of their participation. They vote for a referendum of independence from what's remaining of Yugoslavia, and this basically destroys the relationship with Serbia. Not destroyed, but it definitely alienates them from, and then they just sort of, they're, they're out of the situation. This is pretty late. Um, Macedonia doesn't do much, and we'll explain why that is later, but um, but they're ethnically mixed with Albanians and, and, and Scopians. Um, that term is debated, but the Greeks object to their calling themselves uh, Albanians. So sometimes they're considered Scopians. In any event, they don't do much. And Serbia has no claims, or too many claims, rather, in Macedonia. But they're not putting an active too much effort into this front. But uh, it's hard to say. If, if, if Serbia wasn't tied down so much, would Macedonia become more active than just skirmishing with the Kosovars? Uh, I don't know. Okay, uh, so now that we've basically covered a synopsis or short summary of the events, we talk about explanations for ethnic violence. And in Obershaw's article, he talks about four main ones that are established in the field of social studies. And they are primordial, instrumentalist, constructionist, and anarchist frames. And let's talk about what those mean. So the primordial frame is the idea that people naturally have inherent desires to fight for and promote their own chauvinist sense of, of identity and always push for that. 
they always have ethnic mistrusts of other groups. Um, and and this is this is I guess pretty fair. We take a look at the psychological concept of the in group and out group. People are always going to it, it's always just how you define that in group. So definitely there is merit to the primordial frame. But the instrumentalist frame says uh, no. The truth is, and this is in agreement with, with, um, for example, Shoflin, an author we covered earlier in the course, um, about the idea it's it's the elites, it's the elites who are pushing. Actually, Rowe says this too. It's the elites who are, are have this ideology that they want to push, and they are mobilizing people, or they're drawing some supporters. So it's the elites actually who are choosing to bring into ethnic violence and they're just motivating the people to do so. It's not, or Bermeo agrees with this too, it's not ordinary people who want ethnic violence. It's the elites who are pushing for a certain ideology and, and ethnic violence is a byproduct of this. So then you have constructionist and this is no pun intended based on the picture. The picture is a, a destroyed building from from fighting in the Yugoslav Wars of Partition, but the constructionists um, basically say it's institutions. Institutions, for example, the church. I'll give you an example. They say, well, the rising popularity of the Orthodox Church after communism and the Orthodox Church in Serbia is supporter of Serbian nationalists. So it's institutions like the church and the university that are pushing or, or even diminishing um, movements towards ethnic violence if i understand it correctly and there's the anarchist frame which is chaos manifests itself in violence and this is uh, this is makes sense from an intuitive standpoint but there's been tons of chaos there's there are instances both where chaos creates ethnic violence like in the india pakistan partition and there are incidences of chaos where ethnic violence isn't even a concern so, but, but it's worth considering. Um, Obershaw will go on to reject all four of these individually and take a more eclectic approach to the issue. And he begins this argument by taking a look at the um, Priedor um, case, which is a city in northern Bosnia. I hope I'm saying Priedor correctly. A city in northern Bosnia that is about equally as Serb as it is Bosniak. And what happens is, so Serbs are holding the majority of leadership positions, but um, in the first free elections uh, on the local level, Muslims win a plurality, so they're able to fill leadership seats. And this upsets the Serbs, but, but, but um, the SDA, which is the Muslim faction, are, are totally fine with the cooperative frame and, and they allow the Serbs to retain leadership positions even though they could have filled them themselves. Regardless, it would seem as if the Serbs ignore this entirely and because they were unable to win, they say we're, we're not going to recognize the Preador Assembly and we're going to prop up our own parallel government and this is a problem. So eventually on April 29th, 1992, what you have is Serbs actually have an insurrection, a small coup for the city, and they install their own um, parallel government and they arrest the leaders of the, the actual, and I say legitimate in the sense that they were voted into power. And they they do not necessarily treat the inhabitants of Praetor well. They begin searches and, and harassing ethnic minorities. And the Serb argument would be that this is justified because later on there's a small coup attempted by Croats and Muslims who are armed. And there is actually armed fighting here. Um, and they say, well, look, if they are armed, clearly they are organizing rebellions. We have the right for these continuous searches. But they're, ar they're arresting leaders, they're killing them, deporting them, executing them. We don't know where a lot of these leaders went, but. Um, at least of the Muslim and Croat factions. So it's it's both sides seem to have clearly it is clear that the Bosnian and Croat side has grievances against the unfair treatment and brutal treatment by the Serbs. And the Serbs can say, well, 
from an objective standpoint, it would be pragmatic to um, remove some of these rights from the citizens because clearly this is a time of danger and crisis. Um, this city, Preador, is surrounded by cities similar to it that are Croat and Bosnian heavy mix, about equal or even sometimes serve majorities. Something that happened in Kozarak was a similar situation where 600 civilians died. So that's obviously, you know, and this is a, this is basically um, the rubber stamp of the Yugoslav Wars of Partition. And these are the more, the more like this is the perfect example. And we say, well, why did this happen? If you have a time directly following 40 years of inter-ethnic peace, why then would there be this all of a sudden, in less than a year, snap into inter-ethnic violence? Under Tito, as I, this is this survey data is from um, the Obershall article. He says, um, clearly the people viewed, very few people viewed inter-ethnic relations as bad. And if the baseline for that is no inter-ethnic violence in 40 years, then things must be pretty good. Why would they all of a sudden start killing each other? And this is due to two reasons primarily. And one is the arrival of nationalism. And we talked about Franjo Chudman earlier. And I only bring him up as a picture. He's not, I'm not saying he's the only nationalist. But he was arrested twice for nationalism under... Um, the Yugoslav government because nationalism was a crime because Tito was trying to promote the Yugoslav nationalism in place of the ethnic nationalism. He said, if we are all Yugoslav nationalists, there will not be inter-ethnic fighting and we can preserve a strong Yugoslavia. So when the fall of nations happens and there's no longer anti-nationalist uh, or restrictions basically, or these gags, people are, are actually going to express the true ethnic national they feel inside and it's an outpour it's like a volcano the pressure is building 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 and as soon as the top comes off as soon as communism collapses they say now's a perfect time to express our nationalism and that's why you have uh, well it's part of the reason it's a contributing factor as to why um, nationalists are popping up in all of Yugoslavia in every country um, and, and they, they're they're ready to fully support these ideas and the people are, are receptive to these ideas and they no longer have to deny oh I'm not I'm not this that would be illegal so it's partially reactionary to the fact that they can finally do it if their ability to do it causes them to do it um, and the way that they're able to do this is one uh, patriotic media and what that means is uh, as Milosevic says as a quote um, he says fourth outright falsehoods were common and intentional according to a media analysis um, in Serbia and Croatia TV fabricated uh, and shamelessly circulated war crime stories the same victims would be identified on Zagreb screens which is the capital of Croatia is Croat and on Belgrade screens as Serb. So you have blatant lying to the people uh, to promote these nationalist ident identities as well as justification for war. And the reason they're able to do this is because the media, after the nationalist take power, the media is immediately absorbed into um, basically it's part of the curia of the new nationalist governments. And here we have another quote, it's pretty important. No one wanted the coming war, but if I don't, someone from my side will kill me. And if my Muslim friends don't, other Muslims will kill them. And this is uh, both illustrative of the lower level and macro level of, of government or political happenings. Because at the lower level, this attitude of if he's not, if he's not with me, he's against me was definitely present. They said, oh, you know, if you're not willing to stand up to the Bosnians who are killing our people, you are getting in my way. And they did it at the government level. Inside the parties, you have the extremists forcing out the moderates. They say, how dare you oppose me? 
you know, I'm trying to help our people it's Serb for Serbia. And you're saying no, it's too late for that. And so the situation compounds on itself. So once the violence starts, the appeals of the moderates become less and less um, potent. Because what are they going to say? Oh, it's actually time to negotiate. No, we're in a time of violence, the extremists say. We don't, there's no going back. And, you know, this is, this is partially true in the sense that it, it is much harder. Once the violence happens, the extremists are much more likely to take power. And this makes sense. They're forcing them out, and they're and they're they are killing members of their own party, who are moderates. They say, "Don't get in our way," you know. We're running the show now, and so a lot of the violence happens within the faction. You have intra-faction fighting, and extremists are really able to take over, and they're able to leverage the situation. And so, the summary or, or the or the analysis that's drawn from this is the separation between cooperative and dormant crisis frames. And what I mean by this is there's a cooperation frame which had existed for 35, 40 years, where every Yugoslav citizen is working together on a broad level. And this to, to different levels, like different uh, convictions throughout the time, but they're working together. And this is the cooperation frame. But the crisis frame is a time when there was ethnic fighting. In World War II, the Ustasa, the creation of Ustasa was brutal, brutal to the Serbs. Um, murdered them by the hundreds of thousands, the SS and the fascist Italians. So both the Germans and the Italians were saying, well, you're taking it too far. Even at the point when, when the SS is, is claiming that the Croats are taking it too far, that's that should definitely be an indicator. So this is crisis. This is the crisis frame. The perspective is they hate us. They're going to exterminate us. We are in crisis and we have to act accordingly, right? So the idea is there's a switching of the frames. If the extremists can activate the crisis frame in the people, the people will support or at least not oppose it's the demobilization, as Gan Young talks about, the demobilization towards extremist views. So we are in crisis. Our perspective has changed. So... You know, we have to support extremists. And the extremists are saying to the moderates, you know, people who are still on the cooperation frame, they say, are, are you suffering from some kind of cognitive dissonance? How can you still believe in cooperation when you see what's happening? So they're using preemptive crisis to indicate crisis. So it's basically a self-fulfilling prophecy. And this is interesting. And so this is this is what um, Obershaw is talking about, where it's partially primordial, because this in the crisis in the crisis frame, you it is entirely primordial because the people have a natural instinct; they they're definitely going to fight each other when they see fighting is going to happen anyways. They sense persecution, so they have an inherent mistrust, and this mistrust is not built on nothing. The mistrust is built on centuries of conflict. It's not like World War II is the first thing. And it's not like it's only going one direction because the, the Serbs also mistreated the Croats under Tito. So you do have primordial, but it's also instrumental in the sense that the leaders, the extremists are pushing this frame on the people. The extremists are pushing this frame on the people. It's also anarchist. Because it's the situation of chaos allows this, the, the frames to switch. And so this is what um, I believe is the takeaway from Obershaw is, is, is what is this, uh, the cognitive frame. It's, it's an eclectic approach. We're saying look at these different factors. If we can get the people to switch their own frame, uh, their own perspective, that we're actually changing the reality of the situation, which seems like it's exactly what happened. Um, so that's what I think about this reading, about what we're about what we're doing, the subject. Hopefully you learned something, I learned something. If you have any corrections, please tell me. I don't think anyone's gonna watch this, but uh, but if you do, you know, I would love to learn more. It's something I'm interested in. And uh, thank you for watching.